are no longer a Christian nation. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will this be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For the nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquake in very various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. And they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and, and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. You know, the uh, video that you watched up there, the guys did a good job putting that together, by the way. Uh, it took uh, some expertise way over my head to see that video get put together. And I appreciate them doing that. That video closes with the question, are we there yet? You remember when you take your children out on a vacation somewhere, what's the question they ask all the time? Are we there yet? Well, it poses a good question, does it not? Are we there yet? If you look around the world today, there are people that are posturing that question all over the place. In fact, the disciples did the same thing. You can look here. Jesus had just told them uh, that the temple was going to be destroyed. That there was not going to be one stone that was left unturned. And verse 3 of the text says, as, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things, these things being the destruction of the temple, the inauguration of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the close of the age? Basically, they were asking him two questions and it had three different veins to it. The first question uh, that they ask him is, when are you coming? When is it that you're coming? And the second uh, question was like it, kind of, but what will be the signs of your coming? They were asking, as you see, that, what will be the sign of your coming and what will be the sign of the close of the age? You know, there are a lot of people that are beginning to ask that same question. I, I got to play couch potato yesterday uh, and watch uh, some of the TV uh, the History Channel, in fact, I watched a lot of the History Channel yesterday, and if you did the same thing, what did you see? Disaster after disaster after mega disaster, Armageddon, the end of the world, 2012, we kept hearing that date pop up over and over again. There are many people in the history that have claimed to know when the end of the world is taking place. Nostradamus, uh, uh, postured himself as a, a prophet that foretold future events. Uh, he, along with uh, others, agreed with the Mayan calendar that puts the end of the world December the 21st, 2012. And doggone, I was saving up my money for December 25th that year. One man, back in 1988, published a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Returning in 1988. And when Jesus did not return in 1988, he wrote another book, the sequel. 89 reasons why Jesus is going to return in 1989. I can't believe it's sold. But make no mistake about it. God's word says in verse 36 of this same chapter, 
that concerning that day, the end of the world time, and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only. Now I want you to think about that. When Jesus says something, he absolutely means it. He says no man knows, not a prophet, not a physicist, certainly not a politician, not the army, not a, not a carn artist like the guy called Benny Hinn. No one knows when Jesus is coming back. In other words, it would be a futile exercise for us to come and try to determine the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back. Having said that, I can say dogmatically so that the Mayan calendar that says that the earth is going to end in 2012 is wrong because even the Mayans do not know when the end of this earth is going to take place. But just because nobody knows when Jesus is coming back doesn't mean, my friends, that he's not returning. Just because only the Father in heaven knows doesn't mean he's not coming back. Jesus is returning. And when he returns, he's going to make everything right. He's going to see that the murderer will receive his death sentence. He will see that the rapist will be openly put to shame. When Jesus returns, the robber will repay for his crimes. The idolater will bow down to the king of kings. And the legalist will be brought to trial with the judge that judges righteously from his throne. And I want to promise you this, when Jesus returns, all those who are not ready, all those who are not found washed in the precious soul-cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ will spend an eternity in hell. Ready or not, when Jesus comes, he is coming. And so when we look at this scripture today, what really matters most is not that we postulate when is Jesus coming? But recognize that he is coming, and if he's coming, we certainly want to be ready for that return. In fact, we want to be found as saints that are going about their master's business. You do not want to be caught sleeping when Jesus comes, I promise you. So in this text, he tells us, basically, I think you'll see 12 signs. You might grab some more out of that if you want to, but about 12 signs of things that are going to take place. And when this was written, I want to be very explicit about this. When this was written, he had just finished telling them, do you see this temple? Not one stone is going to be left unturned of this, te of this temple. And so the disciples asked him the question, when will we see this? And when you hear this passage, it's over and over again. You will see this. You will see this. Don't be afraid. You're going to see this. You're going to see this. These things you're going to experience. In fact, later on in this chapter, the Word of God tells them that this generation, you guys, the disciples, you're going to see all this come to pass before your very eyes. And so let me define the end of the age too before we get this because Jesus did not say, I want you to notice it with, with me in this text in verse 14 is where we're going to focus in on today. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. What he's speaking about specifically there is the end of that Jewish age and the destruction of the temple. There's a bigger connotation for you and I as we get into this. But let's look at these signs. Uh, don't look at the time, but look at the signs. And from verses 5 through 12, he gives those to, those to us. He says, make sure nobody leads you astray. There will be many that will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. If you were preparing a checklist for the, uh, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it would begin right here. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. Has that happened? Yes or no? Yes. It's still happening today. 
but it was seriously happening after Jesus ascended into heaven. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Has that happened? Have you watched the news? See that you're not alarmed. This has to take place. The end's not yet. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Yes or no? Yes. So that's happened. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Now he's talking to his disciples. They will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Yes, yes, it has happened. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Yes, absolutely. As the persecution uh, intensified on the disciples and those that professed to be Christians, it, 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 it was like the world was turning the heat up because they were testifying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the, the heat got turned up, many of them decided, hey, this is too hot for me, and they fell away from the faith. Let's keep reading. He says in verse 10, then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Yes, absolutely. 11, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Yes, Yes, it has happened. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow what? Cold. Has this happened in the history since Jesus was preaching on the Mount of Olives? Yes. Yes, it has happened. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And another way of saying that is those who are saved are absolutely going to endure to the end. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed. Now, let me talk to you about this this morning. You see, when you read these signs, and you look at these signs, I want to ask you something. You look at the first 11 signs I read to you, is there anything that you can do about them? Anything? Can you stop an earthquake? Can you stop a tornado? Can you stop a hurricane? You'd be kind of foolish to try that, wouldn't you? There is nothing physically possible to stop any of these events. Can you stop, can you stop the world from going to war? You can't. Those of you that are going to be listening to this on the internet, I hope this goes somewhere. I want this said from the mountaintop. Al Gore... Barack Hussein Obama and all your minions that are going to the global warming conference up there, you can do what you want. God's got this world in his hand and he's going to take it where he wants to and if he wants to heat it up, there ain't nothing you're going to do to stop it. When God says something's going to happen, you can't stop it. It's going to take place. You might try to bring peace in the Middle East, but until the Prince of Peace comes back, there will be no peace because God's word said there will be no peace there. Your efforts are futile. You are a sham artist that is robbing this nation and everybody else with everything they've got. And until you bow to Jesus, there will be no peace. And so, we read in this scripture here, and Jesus says, there is something that my children are going to be doing. I can't tell you the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back. I can tell you that he is coming. I can look to the signs and say, I don't know how much worse it can get. But I can tell you this. I can't stop those things, but I can be about my master's business. If my Lord who bought me with his precious blood on the cross at Calvary has given me his marching orders and I profess him to be my king and I'm one of his soldiers, then I want to be found doing what he tells me to do. Do not be found otherwise or do not declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so he tells us in verse 14, basically he begins the marching orders. In fact, over the next several weeks, we will see if we are true servants, true subjects of the king or not. 
But he begins with this, and I think it's a good place for us to start. He says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So first he tells them, let me tell you about the message that's going to be proclaimed or the message that is preached. I like this because he says, this gospel of the kingdom. There are other gospels being preached today. There's the gospel of prosperity. God wants you rich. And if you'll just believe and give us your money here at the pulpit, he's going to make you rich. No, that's not the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is not a feel-good, happy Peter Pan, think a happy thought and everything's going to be all right. There is a gospel that is a false gospel But there is the gospel that is of the kingdom that is the true gospel. And that gospel is that all those in Christ Jesus will be saved and all those outside of Christ Jesus will not be saved. It is the gospel that is a good news unto salvation for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are his subjects. It is the gospel of the kingdom because we have a king that is ruling over the hearts and lives of his people today. And all God's children said, amen. You know, somebody said without the king, it's just dumb. Don't, let, don't think about that too long. It probably didn't translate for Nada very well either. This gospel, he says, this gospel is the message that is to be preached. Inasmuch as we try to, uh, we try to help Folks that are in need. Our church family, when somebody's in need, we try to rally around and help them. And in as much as we're able to help beyond that, if somebody needs food, we want to give them food. Those things are all well and good. But apart from the gospel, nobody can be saved. Apart from the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of Muhammad, not the gospel of Confucius, not the gospel of Buddha, but the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is what saves. And he says it's this message that's going to be proclaimed, the gospel of the kingdom. And when we get serious, Christians, about spreading that gospel, then we will see God glorified. Amen? And so he tells us the message preached, but he also tells us the method in which it's to be preached. First off, he says, this gospel will be preached or this gospel will be proclaimed. In other words, there are subjects of Jesus that are actually going to speak what God's gospel is. You can love somebody, you can talk to somebody, you can cry for somebody, you can pray for somebody, but until you give them the gospel, they do not have what they need to be saved because you cannot be saved apart from the gospel. So the first part of this method of preaching the gospel, it has to come from your lips. If you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you can't speak well, it's okay. You can write things down on a gospel track and give them to somebody in the name of Jesus Christ, but give them the gospel. It must be proclaimed. Amen? Number one, that's a, that's a verbal proclamation of it. But then he says something that's very interesting. He says, this gospel will be preached into the whole world. That word world there is very interesting. That word world there uh, is not the word that you get when you read John 3.16. How many of you know John 3.16 by heart? Come on, do it with me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You did a good job memorizing that. God so loved the world, that word there means the cosmos. But in this context here, he says this gospel will be preached in all the world. It's a completely different world and, uh, world that he's talking about. It means the inhabited earth. The known inhabited earth. Now this might shock you. Did you know that by the time after when the, when the temple was destroyed, after that, that the whole inhabited known world, the known inhabited world, the gospel had been proclaimed in then? Did you realize that? The Apostle Paul says so. He said, this gospel in which I preached in the whole world, and he uses that same word, world. Man, that's an interesting statement. 
Well, what does that mean for you and I? Well, he says to the whole world and to the nations, the ethno-linguistic people groups. It means that that gospel was proclaimed, but that gospel is still sounding out today. And the known inhabited world has increased. We've known more and more about this world, do we not? They're still discovering tribes that they've never discovered before in South America. And what that means is, is that you and I are supposed to be out proclaiming this. And our church, the reason we band together is so that we can proclaim the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ to the uttermost parts of this earth. But it can also be across the street from your house to another ethno-linguistic people group that live right outside your door. But it must be proclaimed to them, the scripture says. He, he tells us that's the method to go and proclaim it to all of them, even each people group. And then he gives us the mandate. He says this gospel will be preached. Now I've heard bleeding heart stories from preachers before. If we don't do it, if we don't get out there and do it, it's not going to get done. What did Jesus just say? It might get preached. He said it will. Wasn't it Jesus who, who was told, hey, all your people are making too much racket about you coming into town here riding on your donkey. And he says, look, if you shut them up, the very rocks on this earth are going to cry out my glory. Listen, you know what that teaches me, good American Christian? It's not time for us to sit around with platitudes in our comfort zones and sit and wait for the Lord to come rapture us. No, this gospel will be preached and it will be preached with you or without you. But it's a mandate for us to get out there and preach it. And so lastly, he closes with this. I want you to read it with me. I want you to read this verse with me in verse 14. Out loud. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the, what? The end will come. He gives us the motivation to go out there and preach it. I want you to think about this. It was preached. The apostle Paul declared to the whole world known inhabited world he went to all those regions but since then we've known that this world has been growing and we've learned of all these other people groups and he gives us some motivation he was speaking specifically then of the end of the reign of the temple he didn't say the day of the Lord there we're going to learn about that later so please don't get all caught up in that right now but what does it mean for you and I that are here today it means simply this. We know that there is an end that is coming. Jesus is returning. And when he comes back, he's setting up shop. He's setting up. He, he, when he comes back, it's all over for everybody else. And he gives us this motivation. He says the end will come. Well, how many of you want to see death and destruction? Nobody's raising their hand. How many of you want to see the end of death and destruction? Oh. How many of you would like to see the end of disease? You could become a doctor and learn and study and try to cure hundreds of diseases and, and spend your life, spend your life effort trying to cure, uh, cure diseases. And that would be a, a good and a worthy, uh, a worthy thing for you to do but it will fall short of telling the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus returns, it will be the end of disease. How many of you would like to end the wars? Some of you are like, no, I guess I'm liking it. When Jesus returns, it will be the end of all war. The scripture says there will be earthquakes in various places. That happened back then in that generation. There were, there were multitudes of earthquakes. There are books that, that are resounding with how many tremendous earthquakes there were then. But did you know that earthquakes are increasing now? I want you to take a guess. Looked it up last night. Now, if there's been some more since 11 o'clock last night, I don't know. But as of yesterday evening, late, do you know how many earthquakes that were in this world that registered 4.0 or more 
307 earthquakes in the last 30 days, registering 4.0 or more. Is that amazing? Is that absolutely amazing? Counting the ones that happened in California last night. Count, counting those two. There's earthquakes. How many of you would like to stop an earthquake? Well, they'd have you believe to put a fluorescent light bulb in your house uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, quit using your air conditioner in your car and start pedaling your bike to work. It's going to stop these earthquakes and this warming stuff from happening. It's not going to happen. The Word of God says there's going to be that. It's going to happen, right? But there is coming a day when it will come. And that day is going to come when the known inhabited earth has heard the gospel. The promise is this. The end's going to come. I don't know about you, but I want to be the kind of person that when my master comes, he finds me busy about the work that he's called me to do. And it's not just me. You're saying, well, wait a minute, preacher. It's preachers that proclaim the gospel. I beg to differ with you. The word of God says that you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You have been given the word of God. And our function is to glorify God. That glorify means to magnify him throughout this known world. And we do that by proclaiming the precious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel says this, that you were born in sin. You were born diseased in your heart. You were not born pure and innocent. Did you know that, Gerald? Courtney's going, yeah, for real. You weren't. Lana, I'll bet you your dad's sitting right over here. I'll bet you he could tell you that you pitched a temper tantrum by the time you were three or four weeks old. You were born sinful. Nobody had to teach you. Did you know that? Nobody had to, Brianna, isn't that right? Nobody had to teach you to do anything wrong. You knew it all by yourself because it's instinctively in you. And that means that because you were born sinful, you were born at enmity with God. In other words, you were an enemy of God. He has every bit of right to take you out. There's nothing that any of us can say to say, oh, I'm good. I gave the shirt off my back. I gave to church. I, I'm basically a good old boy. Good old boys can bust hell wide open. Well, you say, Brother Mike, that's not good news. No, it's not. It should cause us to have fear and trembling. The good news is this, that there was a man that walked this earth that was actually God incarnate flesh. His name was Jesus. And he never broke the law once, never sinned one time. And what he did for each one of us, for every one of us in here, those that believe in him. For every one of us, he went to the cross at Calvary. And he said, I'm going to take her place. I'm going to take her place. I'm going to take his place. I'm going to take his place. I'm going to do that because there's no way that they can ever have a relationship with the Father. I'll do that. I'll take their punishment for them. And the scripture says that he bled and died and suffered that God actually turned his back on him. He was buried, and he rose again from the dead, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And here's the good news, is that all those that believe what I just said, that believe in him, and know that they are lost in their sin, and you have no other place to turn, Al Gore's not going to save you, the President of the United Nations is not going to save you. Money is not going to save you. Health is not going to save you. You realize now that everything that you've ever pursued, none of that is going to save you. But you know right now that, that the only hope you got is just to grab on to the, and cling, bow down before Jesus and cling to him and say, God, I, I'm guilty and the only way I can get in is with you, so I'm staying with you. If that's you today, welcome to the family of God. Because there's nobody in here that could say that they deserved it. But by grace we're saved. And we want to rejoice with you today. If today you're saying, you know what? I don't know about all the rest of this stuff, but I just know I need to stick with Jesus. Then we're going to invite you to come up here. And uh, I want to pray with you. I want you to spend some time praying to God one-on-one -on -one with, uh, one -on -one with Him. Now, 
for those of you that say that you're a Christian, I want to ask you a question. Has verse 14 been lived out in your life? Have you been busy about using your time, your talents, your possessions, and the totality of your being? Have you been busy uh, doing that, ushering in the inauguration of the king? How many of you have been in the military before? I'll close here in a minute. You know, it means nothing when a Baptist preacher says that. Do you guys remember what it was like when they said the the general's going to have an inspection? You remember that? It was mindless, wasn't it? Everybody was working tirelessly, day and night. You scrub that floor and you shine it as much as you want to shine it, and somebody come in and say, it ain't shiny enough, do it again. And if they saw you sitting somewhere, they could have you polishing rocks. But you're going to work, and you're going to shine, and you're going to get ready, all for a general to come through and go, yeah, looks all right. They were really hoping that when the general came, that they saw that, every, that he saw that everybody had been busy and everybody had been doing their job. And I promise you this, Jesus is coming back one day and he outranks any general that ever was put on this earth. And the scripture teaches us over and over again, that he better find his servants busy about doing his work. So I'm asking you today, have you been busy using the totality of your being glorifying God throughout the whole world? If not, then today, would you make a commitment to do that?